Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to call our meeting to order. Uh, welcome to our virtual December Board of Regents meeting. We're all remote today, so I'll call a roll of all the regions one by one so they can be noted for the record and for those not able uh, to be uh, able to see the screen. Uh, Regent Acker. President, good afternoon, President Schofel. Regent Beam. Here. Regent Bernstein. Present. Uh, Regent Brown. Here. Regent Diggs. Present. Regent Illich. Here. Regent Weiser. Aye. Uh, and uh, Regent White is uh, not available today. She's on military service. Uh, also joining us, of course, are the university's executive officers. COVID-19 activity on the Ann Arbor campus has slowed considerably around the Thanksgiving holiday break. Uh, our health professionals are continuing to monitor the coronavirus in our community. As of a couple of days ago, we've conducted about 14,000 COVID-19 tests under the departure testing program with very low positivity rates. Fall semester surveillance and departure COVID-19 testing remain available to the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor community through December the 18th. Cases in our state are still high and our hospitals continue to treat increasing numbers of patients. Please remain vigilant to reduce spread. Wear a face covering, practice social distancing, avoid social gatherings and stay home when you're sick. Preparations are underway for remote activities to celebrate this semester's graduates later this month. Spring commencement will be trickier as it's difficult to assess right now what will be safe in May. We're engaging with students as part of a process for making a decision on the spring graduation. I'm pleased to report that the Regents and I have finalized the hiring of a nationally recognized firm, Guidepost Solutions, to collaborate with us as we implement the recommendations from the Wilmer Hale Report into the misconduct of Martin Filbert. This is one important step in our ongoing comprehensive work to prevent and address sexual misconduct and create an environment and culture where everyone in our community feels they can report misconduct without fear of retaliation. The firm will help us ensure that we implement the recommendations as quickly and effectively as possible while leveraging the considerable work that U of M has done to this point. This includes integrating the Wilmer Hale recommendations and earlier policy reviews with ongoing campus work streams, as well as tapping into the expertise of university offices that address misconduct and faculty experts in this area. Guideposts will also engage with our community beyond the regents and the leadership team. The board considered several firms before selecting Guideposts because of its deep higher education experience and commitment to working in close collaboration with the campus community. Uh, board Chair uh, Regent Illich uh, wanted to make a few comments. You're on mute, Regent Illich. So sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, President Schlissel. On behalf of the Board of Regents and to our university community, we want to make you aware of an important step that we are taking to ensure meaningful policy reform and cultural change at the University of Michigan. We recognize that restoring trust will be a lengthy process and one that is earned. To the survivors, this step is not announced with any expectations on you, but a recognition that full transparency about the steps we are taking is necessary as we begin this journey. We recognize that outside accountability and perspective is critical in identifying and creating meaningful policy and cultural reform. The hiring of guideposts will provide us with experts, independent from the university, who will help this institution do better than it has in the past and better than it could do on its own. In reviewing what happened with our former provost and the lives he altered forever, the Wilmer Hale Law Firm provided recommendations on steps the university should take to make sure nothing like what happened ever happens again. The recommendations must be followed. Our standards must be established at the highest level. 
That's why we are accepting counsel from those with the most relevant experience and perspective so that this time of change is as effective as possible. Our board again recognizes and thanks those who came forward for their courage. We must now begin to create a culture where reports will be heard and action taken without fear of retaliation. To be clear, sexual misconduct will not be tolerated. The experts from Guidepost will help us creatively think through and structure the safety and integrity compliance framework and cultural reform needed at our university. It is our goal that a process founded on transparency, accountability, best practices policy, and top-down cultural reform will serve our university community and someday serve as a model for other universities as they undertake the important work we all must do. Protecting our community, earning trust, and fully recognizing the life-changing consequences that the university's failures have had on survivors requires an approach that focuses on all levels of reform, our policies, our culture, and our people. A university is meant to be a place of learning and growth, a place of owning mistakes and making changes for the future, a place where we come together to sharpen each other and work in unity, making the world around us a better place. As regents of the University of Michigan, this must start with us. With the hiring of Guidepost, we recommit to learn and grow and to, meaning, uh, and to take meaningful steps towards change, not forgetting the failures of the past, but fully owning them and using the realities that we've seen to remind us why we must continually stand for what is right and never stop learning to do better. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Regent Illich. Uh, today, we're also joined by Asha Muldrow, Senior Managing Director for Guideposts. She's a former federal prosecutor who's going to lead the firm's U of M work. Uh, Asha, would you like to say a few words? Thank you. Thank you for selecting Guidepost Solutions. We look forward to working with the University of Michigan on this important initiative. Our focus will be to understand institutional needs, challenges, and cultures to define solutions that are impactful and sustainable over the long term. We recognize that the mission here is to have a program with integrity that is owned by the university with accountability as the highest value and where sexual and gender-based misconduct and retaliation are not tolerated. To achieve this goal, it is essential that we work closely with the university community. We will be reaching out to all sectors of stakeholders, students, faculty, staff, the Board of Regents, administrators, and survivors that choose to. And we encourage you all to reach out to us. We truly want everyone's input. The planning and helping to implement the recommendations must be the result of collaboration to be successful and sustainable. We have an experienced team with deep knowledge of the unique challenges that face universities. We are ready to get to work immediately as partners to create a dynamic program that promotes a culture of safety and inclusion. Thank you again. Uh, thank you very much, Asha. We look forward to working together. Uh, I congratulate U of M senior Amy Tess who was named a 2021 Rhodes Scholar. Uh, she's the 29th U of M Rhodes Scholar and one of 32 Americans chosen uh, for this Oxford University Scholarship. Uh, Amy Tess is from Grand Rapids and she's studying political science in our College of Literature, Science and the Arts. Her honors thesis focuses on mutual aid groups in Detroit during the COVID-19 pandemic. The University of Michigan debate program won the 64th annual Franklin R. Shirley Classic earlier this month. The four-day competition hosted by Wake Forest University was held virtually and is considered the National Collegiate Debate Championship in the fall semester. The Shirley Classic included more than 200 competitors from 50 institutions. In the tournament's final round, LSA students Giorgio Rabini and Raphael Pieri defeated Dartmouth College on a four to one decision. Go Blue. I also express my appreciation to the many faculty, students and staff who contributed to our Democracy and Debate theme semester. 
Even without the presidential debate we had planned to host before the pandemic, we can be very proud that our engagement in important civic issues has continued. Thanks to many in our community, the semester has provided a catalyst for cross-campus collaboration and it's advanced an important component of U of M's public mission. We have a few more activities planned through Martin Luther King Jr. Day and the presidential inauguration, and I encourage everyone to engage. Today is the final meeting for Regent Shada Ryder Diggs after eight years of dedicated service as a regent. According to our research, Regent Diggs is the only medical doctor to serve on the board. This has been enormously important, not just for Michigan medicine during a transformative time for healthcare, but also for our state and the millions of patients that we serve. She trained here in our 2-5 program, receiving both her undergraduate and medical degrees from U of M and went on to do residency training at University Hospital. Her expertise as a board certified dermatologist and as a physician who runs a private practice contributed greatly to her role as a regent, giving us insights and creative ideas throughout her years on the board. She is passionate about providing equal opportunities through education and she hosted a lead scholarship reception at her home for the Alumni Association. Shauna has also helped push us as a university to live up to our commitments around DE&I and to redouble our efforts to prevent sexual and gender-based misconduct in our campus community. She was also an important partner as we've navigated the pandemic, asking hard questions and advocating for testing and other public health measures on campus. To those of us that have worked with her during this service, this comes as no surprise. Regent Diggs is always amongst the first to dive right in to solve problems and work to make our university better. In fact, she said, we need to be active, active listeners, active discussants, active decision makers. Only then can we bring about change. Thank you, Regent Diggs. Uh, I'd like to call upon Regent Illich to introduce a resolution on behalf of Regent Diggs. Thank you, President Schlissel. So I'm, I'm going to read a Regents resolution and then I'm going to give some of my own personal remarks and I invite other board members and executive officers uh, after me if they're so inclined to do so as well. The Regents of the University of Michigan extend their deep appreciation to Regent Shauna Ryder Diggs for her eight years of exemplary service. Regent Ryder Diggs' ties to the university began with her matriculation in the Interflex program, Interflex program and completion of her internal medicine internship and dermatology residency at the University of Michigan Health System. She is a lifetime member of the University of Michigan Alumni Association and many organizations that support the university in higher education, including her current service as chair of the National Association of Governing Boards. Regent Ryder Diggs' perspective as a practicing physician was invaluable to her work as chair of the board's Health Affairs Committee and in her thoughtful advice as we navigate through a global pandemic. She cares deeply about access and affordability, supporting the Go Blue Guarantee and other programs such as the Lead Scholars Program at the Alumni Association. She has always been committed to creating and sustaining an environment at the university that is welcoming to all so that everyone, particularly students, can thrive and excel. Her passionate voice in support of an environment of diversity, equity, and inclusion will have a lasting impact. The members of the Board of Regents thank Regent Shauna Ryder Diggs for her passion, her thoughtfulness, her concern for each and every student, and her friendship. In recognition of her outstanding service, the Regents named Shauna Ryder Diggs Regent Emerita and wish her the very best in all her future endeavors. I just would like to, yay. <laughs> I'd like to kick off and just say that um, I am gonna admit a conflict and bias uh, at the beginning here that I'm about to share some thoughts about one of my best friends on the planet. <sighs> Sorry. So, um, Shauna has an unbelievable commitment to the university and has been a tireless advocate for those most in need. 
She's highly accomplished. She's a devoted wife and mother. She's an outstanding physician. She's got a sense of fun like no other. And while it's a huge loss for the university and I, I will miss you <laughs> and your important voice on this board, I am so excited to see what God has, what door he's gonna open next for you. As I know that whatever door that is, you are going to flourish and be remarkable. So uh, I'm incredibly blessed to have you in my life as a friend. Thank you so much for your service of eight years uh, at the Board of Regents. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Regent Illich. Uh, uh, yes, Regent Brown. Yes, I'd just like to say a few words, uh, not so much to Regent Diggs because we've, we've had some chance to to say those things uh, recently. I'd like to say them about Regent Diggs to the University of Michigan community. Um, uh, and no offense to the rest of uh, my fellow regents, uh, but for the public, most much of what we do um, is, is hard to see. Uh, the hours, the debates, uh, the study that we take and do on every issue. Um, but when we do those, what I have seen is Regent Diggs has been the smartest of us, uh, the most diligent of us, and the most wise of us. And uh, we will be worse off for her leaving the board. I will be worse off for her leaving the board. But uh, this institution is so much better for the eight years that she has spent on it. And we have all in countless, countless ways uh, benefited uh, from her wisdom and hard work. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Brown. Uh, Regent Bernstein. Thanks, Mark. I, and so Shauna, this is also a very, this is a tough meeting for, for, for me to see, uh, to, to, to know that this may be one of the, uh, last times we're, we, we work as colleagues, perhaps on this board, um, but um, we shared some, 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 some memories last night together. Um, what I'd love to share now publicly was, you know, uh, to, to echo everything that, that Denise said and that um, all of my, co that Paul just mentioned and, and every, I agree completely with, with, with them and their sentiment. Um, um, but I always, it's funny when, it, when we were, you, you were, you were able to address really complex and oftentimes contentious issues with a, uh, a, 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 an intelligence and a thoughtfulness and a spirit that um, so, uh, addresses the problem in the most, in the highest possible way and elevates all the people around you in doing so. Um, and that is a very rare gift and, and one that is, is more important now and today and than, 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 any, than in any moment that, I, that I've ever been a part of. Um, and so your work elevated this board, it elevated this university, and in doing so, it really um, enriched our, our, our world. And so I'm, I'm very grateful to you for this, the way, the service that you've given to the university and, and to our friendship. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Regent Acker. Thank you, President Schussel. I'll I will be brief as well. Um, you know, we had the opportunity, obviously, to to speak a little last night, um, and so you'll have to. I apologize for those who heard this story, but I I, I want to share it again for the public because, like Regent Brown said, um, you don't really get to see a lot of the behind the scenes of what happens and and what people's personalities are like. Um, but I. Um, I, I was think, recalling back to uh, our uh, retreat earlier this year, and um, uh, after after the retreat, um, we were all just mingling. And my cousin came came in. We were in Washington D.C., and my cousin came in um, uh, to with two things. First off, so to meet her new boyfriend, and second of all, to, uh, to share some good news. And she comes in. And I'm standing there with Denise and Shauna, and she says, great news, I just got into the, to Michigan Law School. And within 15 seconds of Shauna meeting her, Shauna gave her a hug. And it's so emblematic 
uh, just that little moment, someone she didn't know getting to share this kind of joy, the joy and love of an institution that she's dedicated eight years to uh, is something that is not replicable. Um, and that really goes with all of Shauna's service to this institution. Um, people will come and go on this board, um, but what Shauna has done and what Shauna continues to do in her service of the university is, is irreplaceable. We will miss her greatly. I will miss her greatly. Um, I'm proud to call her a friend and I'm gonna go one step further beyond what Regent Brown say. Not only is she the wisest of us, but like Regent Brown said last night, she is in fact the coolest of us. Uh, thanks very <laughs> much, Jordan. Regent Beam. Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, I met Shauna as an undergrad. Uh, three of my fraternity brothers were fellow Interflex uh, students uh, with her. So I was front and center to Shauna's brilliance at a young age. Um, but not only is she one of the smartest people I know, but she's the type of person who can't help but care about certain issues. And I've always marveled uh, at that um, in how she just throws herself headlong into issues uh, to not only figure them out, but the reasons why she wants to figure them out are so uh, admirable. Um, Mark also mentioned uh, some of the effect, I, and I should say it this way, I guess no one's ever explained how I was wrong about something in a nicer way uh, uh, than Shauna does. And as a trial attorney, uh, you know, that's explained to me a lot of times in different cir circumstances. And I guess a couple more things. She's the type of person when I say can't help but care that she's normally my, my neighbor during board meetings, public meetings, she sits to my left. Um, and she can't help herself sometimes during a meeting, she would whisper in my ear, you know, you really need to use some sunscreen. Uh, so things along those lines uh, with can't helping but care. Uh, and I guess finally, I would say that I, my wife and I have three kids and Sean is the type of person that you would want to get your kids around because you would want your kids to grow up to be like her. Thanks very much, Mike. And thanks uh, everybody for those uh, kind and thoughtful comments and to Shauna for uh, years of dedicated service uh, and friendship. Uh, uh, today, uh, is, today is today uh, is also the final meeting for Vice President for Government Relations, uh, Cynthia Wilbanks, who's devoted two and a half decades to the University of Michigan and to advancing higher education in our state and around the nation. Our leadership in research, our economic impact, and our role as a beacon of hope for students around the world has been strengthened by Cynthia's tireless advocacy. Cynthia has, been, has a keen understanding that universities must work in lockstep with civic and business leaders to serve the interests of our communities, states, and nation. For a quarter century, she has demonstrated what I would assert is an unprecedented level of command of how to unite those interests across regions and sectors and jurisdictions, administrations, and party lines. At her core, Cynthia is a true public servant, and she's demonstrated it throughout her time here. Among her many activities, she's co-chair of our annual United Way campaign, serves on the SPARC Board of Directors, which she's chaired for three years, and has time and again stepped up to take on additional duties at U of M. She's been Interim Vice President for Development and for Communications. And this year, she led a group of senior campus leaders who worked to preserve the university's ability to fulfill its mission in the setting of the COVID-19 pandemic. I'll always admire Cynthia's ability to comprehend complex policies and ideas from vastly different points of view, and then to see common ground from which to move forward. This is a trait that is very much lacking in our world. We will miss her acumen, her sharp wit, her unparalleled wisdom, and her unwavering commitment to the public mission of the University of Michigan. She's been a great colleague, advisor, and friend to me personally as well. So thank you very much, Cynthia Wilbanks. We're working to announce a new vice president of government relations soon, 
Uh, but I turn things over to Regent Brown for a resolution in Cynthia's honor. You're on mute as well, Regent Brown. Of course. Thank you, President Slissel. And I too will say a few uh, personal words after I read a, uh, a Regent's resolution. Uh, the Regents of the University of Michigan congratulate Cynthia H. Wilbanks, who will retire on December 31st, 2020, after 22 years of service as the Vice President for Government Relations. A Michigan alumna, she joined the university as an Associate Vice President for University Relations in 1995 and was appointed Vice President for Government Relations in 1998. Vice President Wilbanks used her exceptional relationship building and collaborative skills to promote and advance the University of Michigan in a multitude of ways. Among many accomplishments, she helped create the University Research Corridor with MSU in Wayne State and helped enhance the university's presence in Detroit. Her career includes decades of service. She served as, as president of Michigan's Children, co-chaired the university's United Way campaign, and served on or chaired a number of ad hoc and standing university committees over the years. Her relationships locally and at the state and national level, together with her unmatched knowledge and quick wit, made her an icon of the university and beloved by all who had the good fortune to work with her. So it is with deep appreciation and recognition of her dedication and service that the Regents name Cynthia H. Wilbanks, Vice President Emeritus, for government relations and wish her a long and rewarding retirement. Uh, personally, I'd like to say that uh, for those that understand the university, um, know that the president technically uh, runs the university, uh, but for as long as I've known it, Cynthia's in charge. In many ways, she has been the keeper of the spirit and the soul of this institution for a quarter century. Um, for those of us who believe in higher education and its mission, especially public higher education, we must realize that despite the majesty of our buildings, it's really the people uh, that, that uh, create this place. And no one during that time has been more important um, in, in helping the institution achieve its lofty goals than Cynthia Wilbanks has. Uh, she will be missed. They broke the mold when they created Cynthia um, and it will take all of our collective efforts together to do the job that Cynthia did by herself. So this institution, this state uh, and I will miss you. Thanks Paul, that was great. Thank you Paul. Um, uh, I uh, now call upon Cynthia, who'd like to say a few words herself. Thank you, uh, President Schlissel. Thank you all. I, uh, I do have a couple of comments to make, and I, and I want to note that if we were meeting in person, uh, my husband Roy will be, would be uh, sitting in the audience, probably a little under duress, uh, but uh, nonetheless would be present. But I know he's watching, and I want to give a shout out to Roy, because he has been uh, a tremendous support. Uh, and uh, a champion of uh, my work. And I, I really couldn't have done it without that support. So thank you, Roy. And my family uh, who has all been cheerleaders along the way. So to the board um, of Regents, President Schlissel, thank you all very much for these really kind words, generous recognition of my service to the University of Michigan. As I've said to many over the past few months, I've really had a grand journey over a quarter of a century. And I can hardly believe that I can say quarter of a century and not just marvel at that length of time. But it has been 25 years in serving an institution that I love and working with so many and serving with so many like you and executive officer colleagues through the years. Um, all of us, I think, believe strongly in the promise, the potential, and the excellence of the university. It is for that reason that this work is so worthwhile. And no one ever does this job on their own. We benefit from a team of individuals who recognize the value and importance of the work and commit to pursuing the best possible outcomes to support the goals of the university on behalf of its students, its faculty, and its staff. 
the colleagues that I have been privileged to lead in the Office of Government Relations are dedicated to those goals and have helped me and all of us to be successful in our efforts. Our work fundamentally relies on relationships. And I found a quote from Mahatma Gandhi a while ago that I recorded. And he said, quote, relationships are based on four principles, respect, understanding, appreciation, and acceptance. Without knowing that it was Mahatma Gandhi's words or his description, I completely agree with that articulation of these principles. What I have tried to model and you have shown me in numerous ways over these 25 years is respect, understanding, appreciation, and acceptance. My tenure has been marked by many impactful and critical moments in the university's recent history. To be a part of this leadership team, working with presidents, members of this board, and I've worked with 19 members of this board over the years, executive officers, my team, and numerous others across this campus to navigate both challenging and exhilarating circumstances has been a great, great privilege. The memory, memories will be forever a part of me. Earlier this fall, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed from this earth. She was a giant. Since that time, I've discovered many of her poignant reminders and I choose to close my comments with this one. Quote, there's a sense that time is precious and you should enjoy and thrive in what you're doing to the hilt, end quote. Friends, my time has been precious and I have thoroughly enjoyed what I've been able to do in service to the University of Michigan to the hilt. I am grateful again to all of you for this very special honor and recognition. I thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank, thanks very much, Cynthia. Uh, we'll, we'll now move on in our agenda actually to committee reports, but uh, I feel badly that I uh, passed over giving uh, Shauna the opportunity if she wished to make any comments, but since she's actually gonna report out as usual for the Health Affairs Committee, uh, she can gracefully decline and just give her Health Affairs Committee report or do both. Shauna. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I'll say a few words. Uh, first, I'm overwhelmed by the by the comments of my my peers and and just so appreciative because it's been my honor and privilege to serve on the board with all of you. Um, you know, I I genuinely love the University of Michigan and feel that our institution is so important to the state, uh, to our country, to the world. I mean, it really just can't be overstated. Um, and we have an opportunity to have real impact, which is so, I mean, not everyone has that opportunity and we have it as board members and as part of the leadership team. Um, and I feel that over the past 200 years, we've been able to have impact and we'll be able to have even more over the next 200 years. Um, I do wanna thank President Sussel for all of his support and the leadership team for all of their support and for operating truly at the highest level you know, the work that we do is all about um, continuous improvement. It's never over. And uh, all of you always have the best interests of the university. You hold it in the forefront. Um, to my fellow board members, I just can't, can't overstate how the commitment that all of you show to the university, what that means um, to me, to students, to faculty, staff, members of our community, um, people in the state. And by the commitment, I mean everyone's able to have tough conversations. Um, we're candid with one another. We can really disagree and agree around tough issues. And we try to keep a big picture and focus on solving problems. You know, in doing that, I think as a part of one of the things the board does is it holds the history of the institution, right? So we hold the history and then we still look forward and try to implement changes to improve over the years. Um, I really believe that the friendship and respect that we have for one another is what enables us to do our best work. And I'm very appreciative of the opportunity to be with all of you. 
So thank you. And with that, I will give my last Health Affairs Committee report. <laughs> and that's been a committee that I, I have been, I really am so proud of the work we've done on the Health Affairs Committee and for the healthcare system. Um, being you know, more engaged than ever with across the state and across the region. Uh, so with our committee today, uh, Keith Grand gave, um, he's our Michigan Medicine Chief Patient Experience Officer, and he provided the committee with an update about our patient advocacy reporting system and our coworker observation reporting system that was initiated last year. This is something that we, um, we have been, we've been observing at Vanderbilt University and getting systems with them. And it's, it's, it's actually been going really well for these first uh, 12 months. And I have great hopes for it over these upcoming years. Um, we received an update from uh, our chief financial officer, Paul Castillo about uh, the, two, the fiscal year 21 financial performance. Um, and he highlighted areas of improvement during this coronavirus pandemic through the remainder of this fiscal year. Obviously it's been a challenging year, but we are doing well um, in large part due to the people in our Michigan medicine community. Uh, it was followed by Rose Glenn. Her, she's the Michigan medicine chief communications and marketing officer. And she discussed the recent vision work uh, communication uh, that's soon to be released in 2021. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Regent Diggs. Uh, the next report is the Personnel Compensation and Governance Committee. I call upon Regent Brown. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. I'll be brief. Uh, the committee met today and received an update on current searches from Provost Collins. Uh, the committee also received an update on tenure data and the review process. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. The Committee on Flint and Dearborn, Regent Beam. Thanks, Mark. Um, we met today with Chancellors Dutta and Grasso, uh, and the topics uh, discussed included uh, recruitment, retention, and graduation initiatives, um, and also uh, Dearborn's governance structure and st strategic plan, and then the Flint uh, College of Innovation and Technology and its new bylaws and implementation. Um, I really don't want to uh, step on the toes of both chancellors. I want them to also be able to explain all the things that are going on at both campuses. In spite of COVID, it's very impressive uh, the things that both campuses are doing and the initiatives that they're pursuing. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, we now move on to the consent agenda. The minutes and reports are posted on the website. Uh, next, we have a report from Executive Vice President uh, Marshall Runge. Marshall, you're muted. You're on mute. Sorry. Um, good afternoon. Today, I would like to recommend that the Board of Regents appoint Dr. David Miller as president of the University of Michigan Health System and executive vice dean for clinical affairs for the University of Michigan Medical School. Both of these appointments would be effective January 1st, 2021. In this role, Dr. Miller would provide strategic and operational leadership for the health system and collaborate with medical school leaders and stakeholders to ensure alignment of the clinical and medical education missions. Dr. Miller completed his residency at the University of Michigan and subsequently served as a chief resident. He also received a master of public health from the University of Michigan and has been a faculty member since 2005, serving in various administrative leadership roles as well as a clinician and as a clinician and surgeon. Most recently, he served as chief clinical officer for University Hospital and the Franco Cardiovascular Center since 2018. In addition to his expertise in clinical research and administrative arenas, Dr. Miller is nationally recognized as an expert on quality improvement and health services research. He has a substantial record of service for numerous national committees for the American Urological Society, and he's been an excellent contributor to Michigan medicine. I'm pleased to recommend him for the UMHS president and executive vice dean role. And at the same time, I'd like to thank and recognize Dr. David Spollinger for his service as UMHS president since 2016. Dr. Spollinger has been instrumental in the restructuring of our health system and leading the initiatives 
that have helped us improve and maintain high quality and safety outcomes. Dr. Spollinger has also had various other leadership roles during his tenure here, and we're all very appreciative of his commitment and dedication to Michigan Medicine. We wish him all the best as he returns to clinical practice next year in the Department of Internal Medicine. Uh, thank you, Marshall. I'd like to add my own congratulations to Dr. Miller, and we look forward to uh, working together with him, but also a big thank you to Dave Spollinger, who really is the personification of Michigan medicine. He seems to be everywhere at the same time, knows everybody, tries to make uh, uh, everybody better across the institution. He's a real doctor's doctor. So thanks very much, Dave, for your lengthy leadership services. Greatly appreciated and respected. Um, I next move on and call upon uh, Vice President uh, Harmon from Student Life. Thank you, President Shalissa. The Division of Student Life will continue to deliver on our core work by supporting students through virtual programs and engagement opportunities for the rest of the semester. We're also planning new safe and creative initiatives for winter semester for all students with a particular focus on first year students. One example of an opportunity for students to connect with other students tonight is through a program called UMIX. The program offered by the Center for Campus Involvement has a theme called Meet Someone New Mix. So students can go to the events.umich.edu page, fill out a questionnaire, and at 9 p.m. they'll be matched with other students in small breakout groups. So we wanna encourage students to get involved and stay connected and we wanna support them. So I wanna close by uh, wishing all of our students a successful end of the semester and a safe and restful December break. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Vice President Harmon. Uh, now the reporter of the Dearborn campus, Chancellor Grasso. Thank you, uh, President Schlissel. It's uh, my pleasure to announce that we just published a couple of weeks ago an attractive bifold bro brochure that summarizes our strategic planning effort. It, it summarizes the work of over 100 uh, individuals that worked on a plan, thousands of hours, and does it in an attractive and easy to understand uh, way. Uh, also, uh, about a year ago, we founded the Dearborn Artificial Intelligence Research Center, DARE, under the direction of Marwan Casentini. And this week, we held a uh, conference, uh, a virtual conference that attracted thought leaders from very uh, influential organizations such as Google, IBM, Ford, Oracle, GM, and Intel. The center Host, uh, hosts over 40 faculty members from a variety of different colleges. So it's a great success in a very short period of time. Uh, in another successful announcement, we recently received the first Department of Education Student Support Services grant under the TRIO program, a $1.2 million grant to assist students who are low income, first generation, or have disabilities. The money will be used to uh, provide additional services such as tutoring, financial and, uh, advice, and career and college mentoring. Later in uh, the agenda during the uh, retirement memoirs, Kate Davey will be recognized, but I do want to mention her here as well. Kate has served, uh, had served as provost for 10 years on the campus, and she was provost when I first arrived and helped me in the transition pro process. Kate had a terrific set of accomplishments in her time as provost. Uh, she chaired our reaccreditation effort, completed a revision of uh, the Dearborn general education curriculum, created a, the College of Education, Health and Human Services, and established our ta talent gateway. Uh, I am going to miss uh, Kate as a colleague and I wish her well in her retirement. And finally, I would like to add my uh, farewell to uh, Shauna Ryder Diggs and to Cynthia Wilbanks. I learned a lot from both of them. I thank them for their support of our campus and their wise counsel. And I've enjoyed working with them and will miss them very much. That completes my report. Uh, thank you, Domenico. Uh, I next call upon uh, Flint Chancellor Dutta, who also has a supplemental uh, to offer. Thank you, President Seschel. Um, at Flint, we started the year with Project 2020 at Zoom, transition to Pandemic 2020. However, I'm pleased to say 
that through the collaborative spirit and hard work by our faculty, staff, and students, we have made good progress on Project 2020 and much more. Provost Fees Price and I are pleased to recommend the appointment of Cynthia McCurran as Dean of our School of Nursing, effective March 1, 2021. Dr. McCurran received her BSN and MS in nursing from the School of Nursing at University of Missouri, Columbia and her PhD from University of Kentucky. She comes to us from the College of Nursing at Grand Valley State, where she has been the Dean since 2007. Uh, I'm very pleased to share with you that U of M Flint's new Physician Assistant Program, the first PA program across all three campuses, received its, the provisional accreditation. The inaugural cohort that will matriculate in January is already at full capacity of 40 students. Thanks to the general, uh, generous support of President Slichel and all regions, UM Flint has launched a set of recruitment, retention, and graduation initiatives. We held a campus town hall on Tuesday of this week to share information about all 13 projects and engage our faculty, staff, and students in this new three-year program. All projects are very strategic and UMF specific. Good progress has, already, has also been made to stand up the new College of Innovation and Technology. A national search has been launched to recruit faculty at all levels. And in 2021, fall 2021, we will matriculate the first class. Although Project 2020 is an action plan that seeks to reposition the university for the next 20 years, and we have talked a lot about student success, I wanna make sure and say that we are also finding ways, new ways to support faculty. Uh, with the ent enthusiastic support of the family, the Francis Wilson Thompson Fund has been amended to create several new Thompson endowed endowed chairs and Thompson Fellows. These will help us recognize our high performing faculty and also help us recruit top scholars to U of M Flint. I just wanna make sure that the fund will continue to support the critical issues forum. Finally, I'm proud to share with you that U of M Flint's Model United Nations student team took the first prize in the best small school in the Lake Erie International Model UN conference last month. This is an impressive achievement because the team was just formed this summer and recruited its first participants in August. I'd like to end my remarks by expressing my personal gratitude as well as our campuses to Regent Shauna Ryder Diggs for her unwavering support of U of M Flint, including the successful launch of our new College of Innovation Technology the recruitment, retention, and graduation, the initiatives, and the DEI efforts, and much, much more. Our most sincere thanks to you. I also would express my gratitude to Vice President Cynthia Wilbanks. In my Michigan part one, I knew of Cynthia Wilbanks as I was a faculty in mechanical engineering. In my Michigan part two, I got the opportunity to work with with Cynthia. It was a real pleasure. Her work over the 25 years has positively impacted all U of M campuses, not only Ann Arbor. And on behalf of U of M Flint, I offer our Cynthia as sincere thanks to Cynthia and say go blue. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Deba. Uh, we move on now to two student government reports. First, I call upon Central Student Government President Amanda Kaplan. Thank you, President Schlissel. As this is the last Central Student Government report prior to the new year, we wanted to reflect on some of the accomplishments of student advocacy this semester and highlight some of our priorities for next semester. This semester, central student government subsidized 100 Group X passes to students to support holistic well-being, allocated 350 Instacart gift cards to promote food accessibility, distributed over 300 free graduation gowns to students, 
awarded the Leadership Engagement Scholarship to several student leaders, partnered with several campus organizations to promote civic engagement, hosted a virtual self-care week and distributed free self-care packages to students, and connected with over 30 student organizations to build better allyship across the student body. Also in response to student advocacy, we are extremely pleased that all grading at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor campus can be converted to a pass no record COVID grading scale for both the fall 2020 and winter 2021 semester. We have heard that this opportunity will also take place on the Flint campus, and we hope that the Dearborn campus will likewise adopt this policy. We are also thankful that the university has recognized the unique mental health burden of this academic year and subsequently instituted two mental health days during the winter 2021 semester. In looking towards the winter, we are concerned for the folks in our community experiencing homelessness. As community shelters close or reach capacity, the need for housing is only growing as the virus continues to spread and the weather gets colder. Ann Arbor City Council passed a resolution asking for the University of Michigan administration to engage with them in conversations as to how we can best address this problem. This past Tuesday, Central Student Government passed a resolution doing the same. I am asking you all to work with our community members and respond to their calls for collaboration. The University of Michigan is not blameless as COVID cases continue to rise in our community. Creative solutions have been suggested, including converting unused winter dormitories into emergency shelter housing. But at the very least, we owe our community partners a conversation. As we move into the next semester, our policy priorities include one, mental health. We are focused on the mental health and well-being of our university community and exploring meaningful administrative policies. Two, student fees. We want to increase transparency related to student fees through the Student Fee Advisory Committee and advocate for changes where necessary, especially regarding the use of the international student fee, whose details we believe should be better communicated to students. Three, public safety. We are looking forward to continued conversations with the provost related to public safety on our campus and ensuring that students and community members of color are prioritized in those decisions and for climate justice. We want to ensure that the recommendations issued by the President's Commission on Carbon Neutrality are communicated to our university committee, community. The university must take swift and transparent action to respond to this crisis on our campus and lead the way in sustainability efforts. We're excited to continue engaging with students and administrators on these issues and more throughout the remainder of our term. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Amanda. Uh, I next call on Rackham Student Government President, Marshall Case. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Marshall and I'm the president of the Rackham Student Government representing over 9,000 graduate students here on the Ann Arbor campus. Uh, I'd first of all like to say thank you to, for serving the University of Michigan commun uh, community for all of you. And I am extremely grateful to have the opportunity to address you on behalf of behalf of Rackham graduate students and discuss concerns that face us on a daily basis. Um, I'd like to spend my time discussing two topics that are both historically present and increasingly important in light of the current pandemic and racial justice concerns. These have exacerbated uh, existing stressors for graduate students and added new ones. The first topic is to ensure that grad students can research work and teach on campus safely. Uh, students are concerned with potential COVID-19 exposures in their buildings on campus. Uh, it is essential to provide more transparency and contact tracing efforts on campus so students do not feel that their uh, potential exposure has been hidden. There's also concern that students feel threatened to take time off from their on-campus responsibilities if they feel uncomfortable with how safety measures are being implemented in their workplace. Graduate students must have the ability to step back from these responsibilities without retaliation, pressure, and guilt from their advisors or professors. This highlights the need for stronger non-retaliation policies to protect our graduate students in these situations. Next, I'd like to address how we can increase support and students and accessibility during this challenging time. Uh, students, uh, student representation has been increasingly requested to address longstanding systemic issues. And we are thankful for the inclusion of these uh, voices on committees, uh, but it ad adds an additional burden, especially for students of color that take valuable time away from their uh, progress towards their degree. Um, we are thankful for the inclusion of diverse student voices on these task forces, but we strongly advocate for these students to be compensated for their time. Uh, most faculty roles in diversity and inclusion are paid roles, and we believe that students working on these issues uh, deserve to be compensated as well. On the topic of accessibility, the campus needs to make a greater effort to be more physically accessible for students of all abilities. 
This includes students with both physical and mental impairments, as well as immunocompromised or otherwise high-risk students. Many immunocompromised and high-risk students are not able to take public transportation to work on campus due to health concerns. Uh, please consider providing a parking stipend or uh, alternative uh, transportation options for these students. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank you all for your time and we look forward to seeing progress in these directions. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Marshall. Uh, now, a voluntary support, I call upon Vice President Baird. Thank you, President Schlissel. I'm delighted to announce tonight that we've received a $5 million gift from the Breach Family Foundation to establish the David A. Breach Deanship for Michigan Law. David Breach, a 1994 Michigan alumnus, has given previously to support scholarships for law students in need. This gift creates an endowed fund to help uh, current and future deans advance key priorities. For the remainder of his deanship, Dean Mark West plans to dedicate the funds generated by the gift to support racial justice initiatives at Michigan Law. We're especially grateful to David and the Breach Family Foundation for this leadership gift. It's a milestone in the history of Michigan Law. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tom. Uh, personnel reports are in the materials. There are some retirement memoirs. I call upon Provost Collins for some comments. Yes, thank you, for President Lissell. Um, I would like to recognize the many contributions that Professor Christopher Kendall has made to music, theater, and dance, both here at the university and well beyond. During his tenure as dean, he succeeded in bringing the Gershwin Critical Editions Project to the School of Music, Theater, and Dance. He built scholarship support for students, enabling Michigan to be their first choice. And he successfully led efforts to expand and renovate SMTD's home, the Earl H. Moore Building. I know firsthand that Christopher was a valued member of the group of deans with whom he served. His leadership extended well beyond campus as well, for example, in developing the National Alliance for the Arts at research universities. It is a pleasure to thank him and to wish him well in his retirement. And I would also very briefly like to also offer my thanks, sincere appreciation to Regent Shauna Ryder Diggs and also to congratulate for her many contributions, my colleague, Cynthia Wellbanks. Congratulations and thank you to both of you. Thanks very much, Susan. Uh, I now call for a vote on the consent agenda, including the supplemental personnel items. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Support. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Opposed? Thank you, the consent agenda carries. We now move on to the regular agenda. Uh, items one through three are information only. Item number four, the Carl A. Gerstacker Building, uh, Herbert Dow Building Center for Ultrafast Optical Science Expansion. Vice President Hegarty. Yes, Mr. President, I request approval to proceed with the project, which is described in the board materials and as you know, it is titled the Carl A. Gerstacker Center for Ultrafast Optical Science Expansion. The project involves the renovation of approximately 14,000 square feet of the Gerstacker building at a cost of 9.4 million to accommodate the installation of the new Zeus laser system. The Zeus laser system is largely funded by NS an NSF grant. The completed area and the Zeus tool will be an NSF shared facility open for use by both UM and other research university researchers. Uh, thank you very much. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Yes. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. The motion carries. Uh, Vice President Hergerty, a building name change. Yes, Mr. President, with the move of the School of Kinesiology to the newly renovated Edward Henry Krauss Building, the move of which is planned during the winter term, we recommend changing the name of the Krauss Building to the School of Kinesiology Building. It is my understanding that the Krauss family heirs are all agreeable, and uh, the former uh, LSA Dean Krauss, who it is named for, will be honored in some suitable fashion at a later date. I request approval to rename the building. Uh, thank you. Uh, is there a motion? So moved. 
The part. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. That motion carries. And the final one of these, Michigan Medicine Brighton Center for Specialty Care Steam Replacement, Vice President Hegarty. Yes, Mr. President, I request approval to proceed with the $3.2 million Brighton Central Steam Replacement Project as described in the board materials. Uh, thank you. Is there a motion? So moved. Support. There, thank you. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, thank you very much. That motion carries. Uh, we're now on to the conflicts agenda. Items 7 through 31 are conflict of interest items, each of which requires six votes for approval. The regents have carefully reviewed all of these items and will consider them together as a block in one vote unless any regent requests individual consideration of or recusal from voting on a particular item. Does anyone have any questions about a particular item? Would any regents like to request recusal from voting on any items? I now call for a vote on item 7 to 31. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. So moved. Okay, I'll call one of those the second. Uh, a show of hands, uh, or well, why don't we just do a quick roll? Uh, Regent Acker? Aye. Regent Beam? Aye. Regent Bernstein? Aye. Regent Brown? Aye. Regent Diggs? Aye. Regent Illich? Aye. Regent Weiser? Aye. Well, thank you very much. And Regent White is absent. Uh, so the conflicts agenda passes. Thank you very much. Uh, the next three items are adjustments to the academic calendars for all three campuses for the winter semester and can be approved in one motion. Uh, is there a motion to approve all three calendars? So moved. Second. Support. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. The three motions on calendar uh, updates uh, are all approved. Uh, before we move on to public comments, uh, Regent Acker wanted to make a brief remark. Thank you, um, President Sussel. Um, I just wanted to add one thing. Uh, actually, I'll say two. At the end of the year, um, that has been remarkably difficult. They're remarkably digital for all of us. Uh, all of us uh, on the Board of Regents, the executive officers would not have been able to keep our work going smoothly without the work of the IT team. So they deserve a big thank you uh, for making this happen uh, and keeping us um, accessible to the public. Um, the second thing, of course, was something I was not planning on five minutes ago, but she started crying. So I wanted to introduce everybody, of course, to the newest member of the Acker family, Sydney. <laughs> Um, who uh, will uh, be, uh, I don't know, President so what class is she? That'd be 18 years from now. She looks forward to uh, 2038. There you go. Joining the Hold her higher so we can see her face. All right, I'll turn her around so everyone can see her. That's very sweet. That's awesome. So thank you. Thanks for oh. sharing. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Sydney. We'll try to save a spot for you. Those of us that are still around uh, at that time, <laughs> we'll save a spot for you. And congratulations to you and your whole family. It's very exciting. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. President, yeah, Shauna? Uh, Shauna Diggs, I wanted to just take a small, brief moment, personal privilege. Uh, I wanted to congratulate everyone on the retirement list today, um, especially Vice President Cynthia Wilbanks, it's, it's actually, I would say it's a pleasure, but it's a pleasure to, to go out with you because I've had such admiration for uh, Cynthia Wilbanks all of these years. She's just someone who taught me uh, the importance of relationships and good judgment and a true love of the university. Uh, secondly, it's interesting, I meant to say this earlier, but uh, Dr. Martin Pernick, one of the professors on the list taught me when I was at Michigan, not only did he was he my uh, uh, faculty instructor, but one of the best, most important courses I ever took, which was on medical history um, and the ethical ramifications of all that we do. And so much of what I learned during his course has informed my time here at the university as on, on the board. And so I wanted to in particular congratulate him today. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Shauna. 
Thank you. Uh, we'll move on now and I'll turn things over to Vice President Churchill to moderate public comment. Okay, thank you. We do have seven speakers signed up and I believe they're all signed in. Uh, each speaker has up to three minutes to address the board and then we will listen to our next speaker. And I think our speaker should understand that there won't necessarily be a response to the comments today. Topics often require study, investigation, thought, discussion, debate, <laughs> and, and such. So uh, our first speaker then is Steve Sirklos. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Steve Skolos. I'm a professor of mechanical engineering and civil and environmental engineering on the Ann Arbor campus. I want to thank you all for the opportunity to join you and to discuss the need for the university to act urgently and scientifically on the forthcoming recommendations of the President's Commission on Carbon Neutrality. In a recent paper published in the journal Environmental Science and Technology, my research group showed that the United States electric and automotive sectors must undertake a dramatic shift toward carbon neutrality between now and 2025, or else their 2050 targets, their fair share of native reductions in greenhouse gas emissions will be out of reach. For any one of the time funding similar, we have just a few years to fundamentally change our business as usual. To meet our science-based carbon targets, NOAA will need to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by at least 500 kilotons per year in the next 30 years. However, in the last 15 years, NOAA has only achieved 2% of that goal, 2%. The fact that we've chosen not to fund NOAA emissions reductions not only hurts the planet, it actually makes our emissions reductions harder in the future. And while the Central Campus Power Plant expansion will allow us to achieve our 2025 carbon emissions target, the Central Campus Power Plant could by itself consume a quarter, a half, or even more of our remaining carbon budget in 2050. This creates significant uncertainty for the future of the Central Campus Power Plant, which will likely need a complete fuel switch to align with the carbon-constrained world. Meanwhile, peer institutions have already opted for solutions such as public-private partnerships that could provide 100% of the financing for carbon reduction projects, all while offering those universities upfront cash resources. These approaches are not only economically advantageous, they place those institutions in a better position to meet their long-term growth and carbon objectives. Regardless of our short-term energy choices, meeting our carbon budget while keeping the campus growing we depend on proactive technology development, policy change, behavior change, and a fundamentally different approach to our physical facilities, operations, and mobility. Such changes will take a generation to achieve, so we need to start immediately. Uh, President Schlissel, as you receive the recommendations of, of the President's Commission on Carbon Neutrality, I hope you'll challenge them when they need to be challenged based on science and act urgently with your esteemed leadership colleagues and some of you today to make the first significant moves towards carbon neutrality. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. There was an audio check before that, so we're not quite sure what happened, but in any event, hope, hoping for the best here, we now have Sarah Mertz. Hello, my name is Sarah Mertz. I'm a United States Army veteran, mother, wife, Flint resident, and student at the University of Michigan Flint. I grew up in a small Pennsylvania town where everything was white, politics, ideas, people, and our sociological perspective of the world. I also grew up in a low-income household and knew that the only way I could attend college without accruing more debt for my family was if I joined the military. Due to my ASVAB score, I was able to choose from a list of military occupations that were not nearly as dangerous as those on the front line. Low-income students from disadvantaged backgrounds like me should not have to put themselves through more traumatic experiences in order to attain what is now necessary, a college degree. There are children trying to change their circumstances and their family's generational wealth by literally signing away their lives and risking the possibility of even more trauma in order to get an education. This is why it saddened and angered me to learn about the discrimination the Flint and Dearborn campuses experience through funding. We know statistically that the average household income of Ann Arbor students is about twice that of Flint and Dearborn, yet only Ann Arbor students are eligible for the Go Blue Guarantee. There are so many students that would benefit from this program in Flint and Dearborn. I moved to Flint with my husband and son after separating from the Army. 
I knew nothing about Flint other than that the residents were being poisoned by their tap water, which is an issue that has still not been fully addressed after six years. I had no clue what to expect when attending the University of Michigan Flint or if I would fit in. UVM Flint has become a home to me and thousands of other students. The city of Flint is not just a city, but a community. A community of children and adults who deserve the same education and funding and opportunity for higher education that Ann Arbor provides its students. By providing Flint and Dearborn students with a Go Blue guarantee, you'd be providing future leaders with the access to knowledge that they need to be successful, tools that will help them provide, and the opportunity to change their family's narratives for generations to come. I'm asking you to provide low-income students with another opportunity to attain a college education, one that doesn't risk a life. As a veteran, I know that too many of us make the honorable choice to serve, many of us going to war and some never coming back, whether physically or mentally simply because we do not have any other options. By providing a global guarantee for Flint and Dearborn students, you could be the difference for families like mine. Thank you for your time. Sorry. Sally, I to you're on yep, mute again. Got it, yep. sorry. I didn't want any background noise. Okay, our next speaker is uh, Sharima Bauer. Hello, my name is Sharima Bauer and I appreciate the opportunity to speak before you today. I am a proud 2007 alumna of the University of Michigan Flint, first in my family to graduate with a university degree. As a full-time student at U of M Flint, I enjoyed a robust life. I double majored in Africana Studies and History and triple minored in Political Science, International and Global Studies and Anthropology. I worked part-time in the Office of Educational Opportunity Initiatives. My employment helped supplement my income and I received a mixture of grants and scholarships, including the Pell Grant, but mostly student loans. I served as the student representative for the general education reform and the general education design committees of 2005 to 2007, which oversaw the new curriculum changeover and its implementation at U of M Flint. I attended study abroad trips to Ghana and Nigeria with the Department of Africana Studies, to London, UK with the Department of Theater, and to Belfast, Ireland with the Department of Education. Upon graduating, I went to Purdue University on a full scholarship where I obtained my master's in American Studies and Sociology in 2009. I taught in the American Studies program at East China Normal University in Shanghai. In 2010, I moved to New Zealand where in 2012, I was accepted on a full doctoral scholarship in sociocultural anthropology at the University of Otago, graduating in 2016 with my PhD. Today, I am a full-time grant specialist, writing grants for out-of-school time K-12 programming in the Flint Community Schools. All of my accomplishments, as well as returning to Flint to serve the local community, are a great example of what a foundation in the humanities and social sciences provides U of M Flint students. For the university's largely working class student population, these are fields that open doors to careers in grant writing, PhDs, the nonprofit sector, law school, and other professions that would otherwise be closed to too many. The university must, as it builds towards its future, continue to support programming in the humanities and social sciences and provide students with increased tuition support. Having my tuition covered as a graduate student freed me to learn. Extending a program like the Go Blue Guarantee Scholarship as the one university coalition has and continues to advocate for would do the same for U of M Flint students. I urge you to support the institution in this mission, providing the resources needed to build equity and thereby freeing students to discover themselves and the places where they can best serve our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Jaina Peterson. Good evening. Right now, we are in an unprecedented time characterized by death, divisive politics, and disproportionate struggles. 
There are students struggling in this moment, not because of their lack of initiative, but because society is built with obstacles to impede their success while unlocking opportunities for those with lighter skin and a larger wallet. Our students at the Dearborn and Flint campuses are choosing between finishing school and paying their bills. Many of my friends are taking second and third jobs because they can't afford their tuition on top of taking care of their families. This is the reality on our campuses where most students are low income and many are parents with children or many are parents with children and a household to run. Financial burdens are one of the most significant uh, barriers to our success in life, but especially in our education when student debt has become a national crisis. Accruing debt is crippling to disadvantaged families trying to close the generational wealth gap. American society has instilled this ideal that if we work hard, if we pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, we will succeed. I'm here to tell you that those bootstraps are a fantasy. There are no bootstraps for minorities or for low-income students who are already doing everything they can to continue their education and better their lives. The university's budgeting system is flawed in ways that are detrimental to these groups. The university's decisions will continue the cycle of generational economic strain by lack of a higher education. Having a college degree increases families' financial security and will positively impact future generations and the communities in which they live. These low-income students would immensely benefit from the Global Guarantee and other services available to Ann Arbor students. Most would qualify for the free tuition, so I understand that this is an expensive endeavor. However, if you chose to allocate funds from your substantial surplus revenue over $600 million, it would take only a small fraction to greatly impact the campuses and their communities. The current system of budgeting will stifle opportunities for many Flint and Dearborn students trying to work their way to higher paying stable jobs. It will keep those who would truly diversify our campuses from being successful. I don't want to attend a university that doesn't support and value all of their students. I don't want to attend a university that claims we are united only when it benefits them. The burden on less privileged students is one that you can remove by holding yourselves accountable and giving the necessary funding for the GOBU guarantee, legal and medical services, etc. If you don't, the University of Michigan will be an institution that enables structural inequalities to disadvantaged students. This demonstrates that the university does not support black and brown students, many of whom are women whose value is just as great as wealthy white students. This is a time for you, people whose power and influence changes lives, to step up. Will you maintain the status quo or will you pave the path for positive change in higher education? Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Gina. I'm now calling on Michael Craig. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for your time. My name is Michael Craig. I'm a second year assistant professor in the School for Environment and Sustainability. I study how to decarbonize energy systems. I bet you can guess on what I'm going to talk to you about today. And I also teach courses on computational modeling for sustainability, renewable energy, and a discussion seminar on deep decarbonization. If any of you would ever like to come to one of those classes, learn from some of our wonderful students and me, that would be lovely. So I'm also a member of the Voices for Carbon Neutrality, which is a group of faculty and alumni that have spoken to you before or you to act decisively and uh, quickly on carbon neutrality. So what I'm here to talk to you really about today is how we think about climate change. Uh, I first though want to acknowledge that the university is facing significant pressures. I know we know that COVID-19 has caused a lot of financial pressures, operational upheavals, and that's put a lot of onto the plate of the University of Michigan. And I think the university has also had a renewed focus on justice and equity issues, which I think is, is excellent. And we acknowledge that these are uh, competing uh, things for your attention and your time. What I wanna talk about though, is that how we often think about climate action. We often think about climate action from the framing of costs. We say things like, it's going to cost us $10 billion to mitigate climate change. If we mitigate climate change, we will have less resources to address other important issues. And I think this is really a flawed framing that can really get us thinking of uh, topics in simplistic ways. And it's something that I myself fall prey to, even though I work on this all the time. We, Voices for Carbon Neutrality, recently had a series of webinars on these topics, really. We brought in members from peer institutions, from financing organizations, uh, from you know, justice scholars. And I think there are two key lessons from those that can really help us think about this topic better. One, as Professor Skrillis mentioned earlier, there are public-private partnerships that have been demonstrated at peer institutions that can provide money to the university upfront without any expense on our part at the moment, uh, and that can give you significant climate action. And so it is not that you have to lay out $100 billion tomorrow. You can get money to address climate change and use that money for your other ends. 
And second of all, I think it's so important to keep in mind that justice and equity and fighting climate change, they are not inseparable, right? They, or they are inseparable. They are one and the same thing. And so if we really want to promote justice and equity, we need to think about climate action in a significant way. And so I propose that we should really think about climate action in terms of value. And so when the PCCN delivers their recommendations, I would urge all of you to keep the framing of value in your mind. What value can acting quickly on, on climate change bring to the University of Michigan? And how can it further our value that we provide to society and the ultimate reason for the University of Michigan, which is providing societal uh, good and responsibility? So thank you again so much for your time. Uh, and I really appreciate all your efforts on behalf of the university. If I can ever do anything for one of you, or if you want to come to class, learn from our amazing students, please let me know. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you, Michael. Next is Sarah Hughes. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I'm Sarah Hughes, and I am also an assistant professor in the School for Environment and Sustainability. Um, and I study and teach climate and water policy um, and the politics of urban sustainability. Um, I'll pick up on one of Michael's points a bit. Um, so over the last several years, the university has made ambitious and laudable commitments to diversity, equity, inclusion. These commitments have intensified over the summer as they did for many organizations following the death of George Floyd. The university is also, of course, actively working to address climate change with recommendations from the president's commission on carbon neutrality forthcoming. Um, and so tonight I would like to encourage our leaders to act quickly and boldly to adopt those recommendations when they do come, not only for the contribution they will surely make to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and helping avoid the worst consequences of climate change, but also for their contributions to the university's equity and justice goals. So my remarks on, on this front are informed by my involvement over the past year with the development of the Global Environmental Outlook for Cities report for the United Nations Environment Program. Uh, so this has been a truly global effort to assess the state of cities and the challenges we face collectively in moving cities onto a more sustainable trajectory. And a key finding in this report that's due out next year will be that inequality and climate stability are inextricably linked, as Michael mentioned. Uh, inequality leads to greater consumption, reduced quality of life, environmental degradation. And it also means that those who are responsible for generating greenhouse gas emissions are often different from those who bear the consequences to their health, their wealth, and their future. So solving the climate crisis is not possible without addressing inequality, and addressing inequality is not possible without solving the climate crisis. The same is true for our university. We can't deliver on our diversity, equity, and inclusion goals without also delivering on our climate goals. And a second key finding in this report will be that cities are critical to addressing climate change. Cities are now responsible for as much as 70% of global greenhouse gas emissions, but crucially decision-making power in cities is often very dispersed. So local governments certainly have a large role to play in reducing urban greenhouse gas emissions, but large institutions like universities are significant economic and innovation hubs in cities and so often enjoy a certain level of autonomy and influence um, universities are critical engines of our urban economies, infrastructure, and communities. This is, of course, very true for us here in Ann Arbor, um, and so places the University of Michigan as a linchpin in any broader transformation to a just and sustainable society. So there are many reasons to act on climate change and pursue net neutrality. It can save the university money, it can attract progressive-minded students, it can perhaps even make the university some money, um, but acting quickly and boldly toward net carbon neutrality is also aligned with the university's values and commitment to justice. So thank you very much. Thank you. I now call on Jazz Brennan. Hi, is everyone able to hear me? Yes, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, thank you all for letting me speak with you tonight. Uh, a little bit about myself. My name is Jazz Brennan, and I am a social worker working at the Delana Center in Ann Arbor. Um, however, I don't come on their behalf, uh, just through my own individual understanding of what's going on is struggling. And we are starting to see um, COVID cases come in as we see national cases rise. Uh, we need a space to be able to provide everybody the amount of safety uh, 
and shelter that they deserve. Um, we are working tirelessly to provide different spaces uh, throughout the faith-based community. However, as the months are getting colder, we are concerned that we don't have the people and we do not have the, as I said, the space to do these, um, to, do, to do this. So I have been doing a little research and have uh, found, as other people have found tonight diversity to and I just wanted to be another personal individual to come to forth and say as somebody working in the spaces in which we are needing this assistance um, that it is really our, our goal it is our duty it is part of your mission statement and your values it's part of the um, the message that you give in your Black Lives Matter speech uh, statement sorry if, if you truly are behind the words um, that you are putting out to the public and you are drawing in students like myself, a previous graduate, uh, I, I, I want to be a part of a university that sees this as an opportunity to be the actual leader and best and to go out into the fire and, and make these changes. If we really want to see systemic change, then you need to not just come to the table, but be the table as a resource that the people in the community can consistently use, um, not just for the staff, students, and faculty, but the whole of Ann Arbor and Washtenaw County, truly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jazz. Uh, Jazz is our last speaker. And before I yield the floor to the president and I think a regent, um, I just want to say to uh, Dr. Diggs and to Cynthia, I, I can't say much either because I'll get choked up, but our gratitude is incalculable. We will miss you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Sally, on behalf of all of us. Thank uh, you. I know that uh, Regent uh, Illich wanted to thank, thank the speakers as well, of course. Yes, I just, um, on behalf of the Board of Regents, I want to thank you. Uh, thank you to all of the speakers today. We appreciate your sharing your thoughts and comments. And since it's the end of, a year, of the year and a difficult year at that, the Board uh, of Regents would also like to share some thanks. First to our Michigan students and their parents. Thank you for your strength your resilience and flexibility during this extremely challenging year. Secondly, thank you to our faculty, our deans and our chancellors who have shifted and evolved their instruction and have put their students' needs before their own. Thank you to the staff and all of the professionals who keep the university functioning and safe. And thank you to the executive officers, the provost and the president who work tirelessly to be the best in class. And thank you to our Michigan medicine heroes, to the doctors, nurses, physician assistants, and all of the health professionals who take care of us every day at great risk to themselves. And thank you to my colleagues for your commitment and leadership to the university. Everyone have a safe and peaceful holiday. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Illich. And uh, I'd like to wish our students success on their upcoming uh, final examinations. Uh, have a great, safe, and peaceful uh, holiday break, and we look forward to seeing us uh, either in person or virtually uh, for the winter semester. Uh, thank you all very, very much. Uh, have a good evening. Thank you. We're adjourned. Stay safe.